Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. We are still in the Poland series and today we're doing another video of the history of Poland. This video was highly recommended to us by you guys in our comment section of our previous video. So let's jump straight into it. It's part one of a three part series and it's animated. Okay, fantastic. Let's do it. If you live in Central or Eastern Europe, you probably grew up hearing the folktale of the three brothers, Lech, Czech and Rus, the three legendary patriarchs of the Slavic peoples. While out on a hunting trip, the brothers had a disagreement, as brothers do. I've ever heard of the tale, so we see very black folklore in the Slavic culture, and that's probably a story that um, has been passed down for many of years. I haven't heard of it before. On which prey to follow, leading them to split up. Czech, the eldest of the brothers, followed his prey to the Czech clans. Rus, the youngest, went east and became the founder of Russia. And Lech, in the middle, wow. founded Poland. Because who cares about consistency? The tale differs slightly from place to place, but many include that Lech travelled north as he followed a beautiful white eagle. The eagle landed in its nest at sunset and looked very breathtaking against the red sky. Lech took this for an omen and decided that the land would be his new home. The white eagle is still a symbol of Poland. That white eagle is on the flag. The emblem. It's like the emblem of Poland. Mm. And if there was a sunset and it was like red, you can Im imagine the eagle on the red and that's like a symbolic, like almost like a metaphor. I understand that, yeah. Poland blazoned against the red sky of their flag. Yeah, there we go, oh. on the flag. Is that Hitler? Indeed, Poland did begin with Slavic settlements. The Slavs are likely a civilization that emerged as remnants of the early Indo-European peoples who had migrated out of the Caucasus. From their homeland in Central Europe, they began to expand and migrate in response to the weakening of the Roman Empire. You'll remember this from previous episodes as the Great Migration Period. The Poles loved their new home, which they shared with Germanic tribes from Scan. I don't know, like, anything about European history, where the people come from, where they migrated from. Like, I've got, I'm clueless. It's actually sad. They didn't teach us this in school. This is like <laughs> brand new for me. Brand new history. Like, I didn't have an idea of this. So, I mean, it's not our fault. I mean, you, we didn't get taught this, so... It's nice to see now because uh, you get a bit of a background and a bit of history of where stuff come from, where cities emerged from, where countries emerged from. They're, yeah, the history behind the cities yeah. and the countries. The the cool thing is, is I enjoy the animated version because it's like, it's less intense. Well, it's better for storytelling. It's better for storytelling. Scandinavia and the occasional Asian nomadic raiders. The Slavs of Poland were organized into smaller tribes living in and around the Baltic Sea and the Vistula River Delta. They united under Poland's first official leader. There was a castle, not a castle, but there was this area there called Pomeranian. That's where Sechen is and that, that castle, the Duke's Castle Pomeranian, I think it's the area, if I'm not mistaken, uh, like the state. I'm not sure, not 100% sure, maybe the area is called Pomeranian, but that castle was called the Pomeranian Castle. Mieszko. Mieszko was a duke of the Polans. This was a good gig to have since the tribe eventually became the name of the whole country, Poland. Mieszko was a member of the noble house of Piast, whose dynasty would rule Poland for centuries. With his baptism in 966, the country slowly abandoned traditional Slavic paganism and adopted Western Christianity. Mieszko's son Bolesław the Brave expanded the territory south into what he hoped would be a strong regional power, but alas, it was a bit too early for that still. He established the Metropolitan See at Gniezno, forming the headquarters of what would become the Catholic Church in Poland. His consolidation of power led him to be crowned Poland's first official king. I wonder if Gniezno is actually a city still in Poland. It would be interesting to know because we don't hear, I haven't heard of that city in any of like, the recommendations of people saying go there. Like, maybe it's changed names, I, I don't know. Gniezno. King and then he died, all in the same year, which is great. The Piast dynasty was somewhat up and down, and internal conflicts often plagued the royal court. Until this guy, Kazimierz the Restorer, restored the monarchy's control. 
which come to think of it is probably why they called him the Restorer. He modernized Poland into a feudalist society which came with all those cool things like knights and lords and castles. This helped secure the borders who up until now had changed depending on who was king. Castles is one thing that Poland has a lot of. Just like Germany, there are a lot of castles. I think we saw in one of the previous videos. The biggest castle by land area is in Poland. It's on that uh, river. It's on a it's on a river. Yes. What's that river's name? I'm not hundred percent sure. We'll we'll link the video over here in the top. But we watched the video. The early kingdom, somewhat weaker than its neighbours and strapped for cash, did however hold the Mongol invasion into Europe having been sacked twice before. Notable of this time was the Polish relationship with the Germans, whose dukes and lords had come to possess large amounts of the west, and the Teutonic Knights, who had carved out a significant state for themselves in Livonia and Prussia, a land inhabited by pagans, frequently raided by crusaders. By the time Piast rule ended with Kazimir the Great, Poland had lost much of its territory to its neighbours, but with a it seems like a majority of the battles that were fought back in the day, and even today still, is all over land. It is. Territory. Territory. And just fighting over basically land and occupation resources. Um, but this is obviously linked to those battles that we watched in the previous video. I think like worldwide, worldwide most wars were about land and resources. Yeah. So this is, I mean, you can see how Poland's territory constantly kept on changing and shaping because they would win this land and lose that to the neighbors. So it's really interesting to see how they transformed. And evolved. Yeah, throughout the years. With a period of peace, the state soon began to prosper and attract Jewish settlement. The counties in this area became a source of contention between the kings of Poland and the Holy Roman Empire. Who fought over the local lords for fealty and allegiance. Pomerania, sit down. This resulted in these counties being very mixed with populations of people from both kingdoms. The whole thing was very unbohemian, really. The Jews first settled Poland as merchants on popular trade routes. Yes, By Prague. this century, the Jewish mm. people had settled in. So we've been to Prague, a uh, beautiful city uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, very, very old, lots of history, most haunted city in Europe. We'll link the video to our, uh, our journey in Prague. ...in great numbers over many kingdoms in Europe and began their long and very sad history. They were expelled by the masses in all the countries they settled and were often victims of massacres and worse, crusades. Successive expulsions led the population in Poland to swell, which was a comparatively more tolerant society, which became a centre of Judaic learning and culture as the centuries continued. However, things weren't always super peachy and anti-Jewish riots often erupted in Polish towns and synagogues were frequently burned. King Kazim it seemed like Jewish people were also just under a lot of like, threat. Threat. Yeah. Uh, in many ways. I don't know a lot of the history, but it's just there's a lot of well, uh, religious wars yeah. as well. Religion and territory seems to be the fuel of war. Disagreements politically, I think, but also political generate civil war. Yeah. Political religion land. Casimir the Great, dying without an heir, left his kingdom to his nephew Louis, the King of Hungary. Louis left his now three kingdoms to his daughters, one of whom died unexpectedly, the other, who was supposed to inherit Poland but inherited Hungary instead, and the last one, Jadwiga, who got Poland. The nobles of Poland welcomed Louis's daughter and crowned her king. Yes, king, not queen. How? Don't ask. How can you be a king if you're a queen? He said don't ask. Don't ask. <laughs> Jadwiga's life would not be unlike a medieval television drama as she was simultaneously engaged to both the Grand Duke of Lithuania, Jagela, whose kingdom was huge and powerful, and the Habsburg Duke of Austria, who was inbred and fat. Oh, wow. I think she made the right choice. <laughs> the Union of Jadwiga and Vladislav formed the Polish-Lithuanian Union, which was now the largest country in Europe under a single monarchy. The Lithuanians had become a strong military power in the previous century, capturing large amounts of Russian and Mongol land. The now combined countries spread from the Baltic to the Black Sea. It's probably the, the biggest Lithuanians, Poland with ever their was. The smaller at population that, never ventured too far from their size. castles. Why would you? And preferred to rule Ruthenia from Livonia instead. 
so by the time of the Union, the much larger Polish population came to dominate the Ruthenia lands, spreading the language and the culture, eventually dwarfing their Livonian allies. The Teutonic Order, that German state on the Baltic, had become somewhat of a bad neighbour, leading raids, crusades and plundering castles <laughs> or otherwise stumbling drunk into Polish-Lithuanian territory, starting fires and whatnot. Holy the union of the two states proved beneficial, handing the knights a crushing defeat at the Battle of Grunwald in 1410. They also fought... Grunwald is like a forest. Yeah. The Grunwald Forest. They, I know you can actually visit it from Berlin. It's like an hour, hour's drive. Where it's going to be very beautiful and a lot of history attached to that area. And then now we know why. Numerous wars with the Muscovites, Tatars and Ottomans. Noteworthy of the Egalian period was the efficiency of the feudal system and the pseudo-democratic nature of the parliament, who set up sophisticated bureaucracy for king approval, or disapproval if you are unlucky. Within just a few decades, the Teutonic Order had completely lost their state, with the western half being annexed directly into Poland and the rest becoming a faith of the Polish crown. This gave access of Poland to the prosperous Baltic seaports and an explosion in trade. Keep your eye on this, it becomes important later. The Prussian faith would later be inherited by a duke from Brandenburg, a state within the Holy Roman Empire, a trend which would become ever more troublesome as Lord Brandenburg is stuck where we are at the moment, like very close to, to Berlin. But what's interesting to see how big Poland, how big their, their land area was at this time, 1466. I mean, they just about occupied a very big portion of Central Europe. Lords within the HRE would increasingly inherit lands outside the imperial borders. The HRE was weird, don't worry about it. Acquiring Danzig or Gdansk had huge economic benefits. And Gdansk, that's the port that is uh, very highly recommended on our list, and it's in our top three places where we would like to visit in Poland. Cities swelled in size in response to the trade boom, like Poznan, Lwów, and the capital Kraków, and most notably Warsaw. Warsaw, or Warszawa in Polish, was up to this point Warsaw. just a small fishing Warsaw. village. Legend has it that a fisherman named Warsh happened upon a mermaid in the Vistula River named Shava. The two married and found the town of Warszawa. The Poles, like most Europeans, were often embroiled in wars, and this made famous their heavy cavalry, the Winged Hussars, which I'm sure I'll be mobbed and lynched if I don't talk about. Initially a contingent of Hungarian mercenaries, the Hussars soon became an elite shock cavalry so powerful they allowed the Poles to win many otherwise hopeless battles. The Hussars became the envy of Europe, the most powerful and disciplined heavy cavalry the Middle Ages had ever known. And I it's interesting to see that Poles had very good armies back in the day, 1500s, 1300s, and even to this day have got a really good army. Like you wonder if it's part of the culture of the Polish, like the nature of the people, or why, what is the reason why they've just such a strong, like, force to be reckoned with? How? And it's still a matter of intense national symbolism of Poland. The 16th century was a really big one. It included the Protestant Reformation, affecting mostly German parts I mean, of the look kingdom, how big. wars against the encroaching Polish. Ottomans invading Europe, advancing in science and literature with Copernicus, devising the heliocentric model of the solar system, the nationwide codification of the Polish language, and the biggest one, the changing of the Polish-Lithuanian Union into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, a single political entity ratified by the Polish Parliament, or same. With a that is like a superpower. They had the biggest land mass, I think, in Central Europe at that stage. Look how big it is. I wonder when and how they split. It's obviously wars that broke them apart, and but I mean, we will we'll find out. With elected rather than hereditary kings. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, or just Poland for short, became a centre of power and commerce, and a bulwark against invading Turks would become a larger and larger problem for the European powers since their humble beginnings in Central Asia. During the Polish-Muscovite War, the Poles became involved in the Russian Succession Crisis, or the Time of Troubles, and began flexing their muscles with their famous Hussars. They even occupied Moscow for a short period, but were soon driven out because invading Russia is simply impossible unless you are the Mongols. The series of Northern Wars and the Russo-Polish War left the Commonwealth in a very precarious and weakened state. This was Ooh. aggravated by the election of Polish kings, which opened hey. the door for other nations to meddle in Polish affairs, which they did. A lot. Uh, During the wars, the Commonwealth lost the territory. How do you like elect a king? It's normally like by bloodline, so it's obviously they had different 
laws or, or rules back then. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe the bloodline died, I don't know. ...of Livonia and was devastated by the so-called Swedish deluge, leaving much of the nation in ruins. Poland became weakened during the Great Northern War against Sweden, and during the War of the Polish Succession, it became increasingly clear that Poland's fate was going hey. to be decided by its neighbours. The Polish Parliament became ineffective due to complicated veto laws which made passing reforms or mounting resistance to invasion nothing if not impossible. The political limbo and the sheer size of the Commonwealth started to make cutting pieces out of it look pretty attractive. The last king of Poland, Stanislav II, was elected in 1764 as a puppet of the Russian Empire, aided greatly by the fact that he was in bed with Catherine the Great. Oh. Stanislav did attempt reform to try and save face, but was aware the kingdom was on its last breath. Before long, the first partition of Poland was enacted, dividing the outlying provinces between... Oh, yeah. It's like it's just getting smaller and smaller and basically, you know... Shrinking in size. Shrinking in size and basically falling down at the knees of surrounding countries and surrounding powers. Between Austria, they, Prussia... They say that the king that was elected here was a Russian puppet. Oh, most politicians are oh. nowadays. That's a controversial statement. So when... But, <laughs> yeah, but I mean... So when... <laughs> So when he became king, you could see that Russia like expanded completely into Poland. So, are are politicians puppets nowadays? I don't think the Polish president. I like the Polish president. I I think he's a lawyer actually. I like him now. He's he's very firm. I think he is a lawyer. Um, I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure I saw that. But when you know the law and you run a country, I think that's just like. A very good mixture. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and Russia. In dire straits, the parliament was powerless to stop the invading troops and forced to ratify the new borders. The Great Sejm tried once more to reform by drafting a formal constitution inspired by the liberties of the French Revolution. But it was enough to provoke Russia again, who saw France as an enemy and Poland as a sympathizer to anti monarchical sentiments. Pro and anti constitutional forces became embroiled in a war and Russian forces invaded to broker a defeat to the Republican movement. With an agreement signed with Prussia, the two nations annexed more territory in the Second Partition, reducing Poland to one-third like its size small. and population. One third. The king was horrifically unpopular. The yeah. army was in shambles. The parliament was divided and powerless. The common people were furious, and insurrections led to the National Rebellion, led by the military veteran Tadeusz Kościuszko. After an initial success, the rebels failed to garner support from many other nations and would- How do you go from such a big superpower to basically 30% of what you were? I don't know, political. Th this was political. Defeated by the surrounding powers. In 1795, the Austrians, Prussians and Russians decided to put an end to the rebellious Poles and invaded them from three sides. The third partition of Poland, as it became known, wiped Poland off the face of the map for the next century. Millions of Poles now found themselves subject to whichever nation they were divided into, isolated from one another, and Poland ceased to exist. I like seriously just got goosebumps now. I didn't even know that that happened. I saw that someone commented that Poland was wiped off the map like a couple of times, but I mean, Look at that and look at Poland today. So I'm like really keen to see how they rebuilt, like how, how they reclaimed what they had, what they, yes. So, I mean, this is sad to see, but. I didn't know that there was a time in history where the right. country didn't exist, basically. Basically. Now, as you all know, if you've ever picked up a map, Poland did indeed return as a sovereign nation, but we will have to get to all of that in part two. In the meantime... Ah! Oh. Very cool video. I think so too. It, it gives you a lot of context and like explains things a bit better, but I'm feeling very um, sad after this video. I want to see how Poland got rebuilt, so... I want to see more history just about Europe in general. Like, Poland is cool, but I mean, there's so much that we don't know. And just seeing that history and how the events unfolded, I find that fascinating. Um, 
I'll, we, I think we're definitely going to do a lot more of these type of videos just to further our knowledge. Um, so thank you to those people who recommended this video. It was very cool. Um, if there are maybe, you know, more stories that one can add to this, you know, some comments, some context, please drop it down in the comments down below. Um, please uh, like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss out on any of our latest videos. The next part will be part two. I cannot wait for it. So until next time, this is Beyond Borders. Over and out.